So when we step into the presence of God, uh, there is a transformation that occurs. Um, there is a, um, it, it's like being um, a piece of iron in the fire. Uh, do you ever feel like iron? A little, a little dull at times? Uh, the beauty of our God is that he takes the earthly things and he transfigures them. He transforms them um, into something beautiful. Uh, when an artist looks at a block of clay, sorry, uh, of marble or stone, they don't, they don't see the ugliness of the stone, um, the plainness of the stone. They see in their mind's eye the end product. And when our father looks at, at you and me, he sees the end product. Praise God. Uh, uh, because there are days when I feel like a block of stone. Uh, I feel like, uh, is there any beauty here? But our Father, in His infinite mercy, Baruch Hashem, He sees you. And you. And you. And how you can be. And He says to you and to me, He says, you've received from me mercy. So you go and take that and you share that. Um, and then he says, as we are, our minds are being transformed. Do you need your mind transformed? Oh, amen. amen. That a little bit at a time, we begin to become like him. And we begin to see people not as the block of stone that they are at this moment, but for the masterpiece that they could be in and under the hand of God. We begin to see people differently. Yeah, they're the block of stone, just like you and me. But they have the potential to become beautiful. Well, we spoke last week about the care of the garden of the heart uh, in the context of hearing Messiah's words and doing them, okay? Um, the garden of the heart. Um, if you can imagine uh, a field of land, uh, you probably can think of a field of land. You may own one. Uh, if you haven't done anything with it, it's a, it's a bunch of trees, right? And what else would you suppose that you might find on that untended land? Weeds? What else? Stump? Sheep? Possibly. Possibly Rocks. sheep. What's that? Rocks. Rocks, yeah. And snakes. And kudzu. And kudzu. Yeah, welcome to Georgia. <laughs> and lions and bears. Oh my. Oh my. Uh, it, it, it's, it's untended, so therefore it, it has present with it whatever was there. We all come into this world like this land that has not been tended. And slowly but surely, um, perhaps we, we came to believe as children. And we, we, and we accepted the kingdom, we accepted the covenant. Um, is, this, is, is this a covenant that we have with God? Yes. Amen, absolutely. It is lost in our days that there is a, a covenant. It's some magic prayer and boom, you're in. No, this is a covenant that requires action every day. Uh, you don't look back at the Old Testament and say, oh, the, uh, the Israelites just had to you know, dance through the Red Sea and then boom. No, they had to abide by the covenant. And the covenant is truly with our God, this new covenant. So you see that this heart is like this land that is untended. If we are believers, we have begun to clear the land. Um, and here's where the reign of God, the rule of God, the kingdom is within his believers. And so um, if you own land and you, and you have all of this happening out there, um, is it, could it be a little bit disconcerting? To look at the land, there's trees, and there's rocks, and there's some big rocks that you ain't going to pick up by yourself. You have to have help. You have to have in your mind's eye, what do you want that land to look like? What is it that you desire? And so you and I, I mean, we've got it, or we should. We should already have the image that we have, the icon of God that he has given to us. And what is that? Yeshua, that's right. I mean, he is the icon, the prototype, the first of many. And you and I are in this process. He is the image of the invisible God, Baruch Hashem. He has shown and he has cleared the way for us, but he hasn't done it all for you or for me. He says, you take up your cross and follow me. Amen. Absolutely. Um, so in this 
land or so that we're speaking of. There's also streams, uh, and there, there's fountains. Uh, and and the many, as, as, as beginning believers or new, newly new to this world, we have broken things, broken fountains. And perhaps even the fountains that we do have are, they, they have this um, sort of greenish water that comes out of it. Would you want to drink greenish water? Um, not unless it's Gatorade, I suppose. Um, no, you want clean, pure water to come out of the earth. And, and we need clean and pure water to come out of this earth, this heart. Amen. And so these are, again, imageries to, to be able to, to think upon and to examine yourself, to, to see and say, oh my God, I can see one of those broken fountains in me now. I can see this, pra- this patch of my heart that is filled with brambles and thorns. Um, do you want to sit in that? Have you ever sat in, in thorns? Um, it hurts a lot, I can tell you that. Uh, you're plucking uh, thorns and things out of your tuchus for a long time. It hurts. Well, likewise, you and I have these places within us that also need to be cleared. Um, so when we look at the land, um, we should have an image of what we want to, it to look like. These things that are of, of the broken things within us, as we've said, this uncleared, untended land are the fallen state of mankind, the passions, the woundedness of our minds, uh, the reliance upon human means, the wisdom, perhaps, of unbelieving people, the limitations of the visible world. If we were to look at all of that, if we were to look at the world now through just simple human eyes, man, it's a mess. Filled with hurting, frightened people. But God has said to you and to me that we are not to be of this mind, but of the mind that is being renewed and transformed. So how can we refresh the garden? Uh, the imagery that we find in Genesis, um, what was the command, the, the first command that was given to our father Adam? Ten, ten, keep the garden. Yep, ten, and keep the garden. Uh, and be fruitful and multiply. Okay? And likewise, we obey these commandments when we also tend the garden of our heart, which is to re- be, in a literal sense, returning to the simplicity of Eden. And here's where we see Messiah, the apostles, their disciples, Fathers all return to this pristine state of the first human being. Just, just genuineness, this kindness, this place that I'm so far from. They returned to Eden. But then we are to be fruitful and multiply by touching the hearts of others around us, bringing others by his grace into the kingdom. Well, if you turn uh, to Luke chapter 11, we'll continue our, our journey through Luke 11. Luke 11 and verse 33. Luke eleven thirty three 33 says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand, that those who may come in and see the light. For the lamp of the body is the eye. And therefore, when your eye is good, then your whole body is full of light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which in you is not darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having... Uh, no part dark, then the whole body will be full of light. And when, you're bright, and when the bright shining of a lamp gives you light, or as when, sorry, the bright shining of a lamp gives you light. So what is this? What is this referring to? The eye of the body, what is that? Like spirit. Okay, spirit. What else? The mind. The mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, what you focus on, yes. Um, so, what's that? Yes. Okay, so in the, the, the concept of, um, of God, we see this, this term uh, of spiritual heart, yes? Okay, the spiritual heart cannot be separated from the mind, and it's, it's called the intellect. So, and it's this, this unison. So, what happens um, if one of your tires is flat? Can you drive it with, with a, I mean, I've, I've watched uh, some, some shows where people like drove for miles <laughs> on just the rim and finally got down and they even lost the rim. And then they kept trying to go. 
Okay? So when, when things are out of balance in us, we, we, can, we can continue. Uh, and we see this all around us, perhaps in ourselves, uh, the people that are, are around us. Um, what we have, you could say, in this heart, the spiritual heart, we're not talking about the beating heart that pumps blood, it's the spiritual heart. Um, when Adam and Eve sinned, that went dark. The heart went dark. And every soul that is born into this life that has not known the rebirth of the kingdom is born in this state of the darkened heart. Okay, what would you do if your, if your, if your physical heart stopped? You die. Okay, we are born dead into this life. And it is when we receive the kingdom, we receive the Spirit of God, and it says, by the Spirit, you can cry out, Abba. And you take your first breath. It's why the baptism is called the new birth, because we arise from the waters of baptism as a new creation. And this is how it has been since the very beginning. It is a second birth. And our, our spiritual heart is kicked into gear. Okay, it's almost like, um, and sometimes we don't have it here, but if you have a dimmer switch in your, in your house, you can control how much light there is. Okay? And so if uh, it, our, we're born like this, when we come to faith, we receive this little bit of light. And it's like, it's like the lights are on, but it's a little bit dim. Well, if you were to take that switch and move it up, it's going to get a little bit brighter. And that is how it is like when you and I are slowly being illumined by the Spirit. You don't jump into the Bible, first thing, as a new believer and go, oh yeah, that makes sense. No, oh, it doesn't. You're going to be able to understand a little bit of it. Why is it that when we read the same words that we've read perhaps for decades and we go, oh, that makes sense. What changed? You did, your heart. Um, the illumination of the Spirit, it gives us light. Um, okay, so I, this is becoming more and more relevant to me as I get older because I need more light to read. Sometimes I'm there with my flashlight. Okay, that is like the Spirit of God. He gives it hasn't changed. He gives us this illumination to be able to, to see it. Great discernment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we, we see that this spiritual heart is the lamp. Okay. We see that it is whatever our heart is seeking is, is, is what we become. Okay. What are some things that we could seek? Money. Okay. Money. Power. Power. Fame. Fame. Prestige. Prestige. Comfort, uh, stuff. Uh, Messiah says, where your heart is, then that's where your treasure is. Okay? Uh, could we think of anybody in this world who, who seeks after wealth, perhaps has amassed a ma massive amounts of it? Um, when that person um, gets to a certain point in their life and they have the billions and billions of dollars, can they prolong their life? Maybe for a little bit with some machines and something or other, but what's eventually going to happen? You're going to die, and you can't take it with you. And so when we invest in things, stuff, hey, it's nice to have nice things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But if that's where our heart is, that's what we have at the end of this life. And when the moment comes, you're not going to go take that with you. You only take what you have done by him and for him actions that we have. So what is our heart filled with? Do we have good things, present godly thoughts, kindness, righteous and unselfish deeds? Yeah, maybe sometimes, but what, what else do we have? Anger. Anger. Mm -hmm. The passions. And what else? What are some other things that... Pride. Amen. God have mercy on me, a sinner. If our heart is darkened, then what do we do? Throw up our hands and go, oh well, this is just who I am. Yes, that's what people do sometimes. And that is what they are. They remain the block or a partially chipped out block, not reaching the potential of what they could become, which is the icon, the representation of God. He says we're made in his image and his Likeness, okay? The image we retain, the likeness is what we strive for. And so therefore, we have to seek to fill it with light. How do we find the light of God? 
and, and acquire this. How do we do that? Okay, desire. Okay, through his grace, which is? Okay, the power to accomplish his will, his grace, his energy, his ability that he gives to his believers to, to do what he, he desires. Okay, to fill the heart with light. What do we do? Pray. Okay, get into the, the, into the scriptures. What else? Humbly repent. Uh, just once? How often? And every minute of every day. Uh, we, we, we seek him with our whole hearts. Do we ever get to a point in our life where we go, yeah, it's not got enough. I'm, 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 I'm pretty comfortable now. No, I mean, you can. You have that choice. But what should we do and how should we seek God? Every, every breath. Yes. Not as an event. Yeah. Um, when the children of Israel were in the desert, um, how often um, did they go around the mountain? <laughs> hey, do you ever think they, they went, huh, this place looks familiar? <laughs> huh, look, there's that, there's that rock. There's that rock again. <laughs> Leave a mark. Mark. There's that rock again. Have you ever felt like you were wandering in circles? Seek after God. Press into Him. Step into Him and, 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 and seek Him. Um, if, if you go, you know what? What I'm doing isn't working, then we have two choices. Choice number one, we do nothing differently. Okay? Insanity is, theoretically, Okay. Doing the same thing over and over, going, gosh, it's going to work eventually. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Or we change our minds and we begin to do things differently. And how do we accomplish that? What is the, a, a mechanism by which? His grace. His grace. We, we accomplish His grace. Do we just go, okay, grace, get to work? No. Um, if somebody is unkind to you, grace isn't going to make you kind to them. You have to choose to be kind. Is it easy? No. Not unless you're a saint. And uh, if you are, man, let's, let's talk. Uh, and, and you know what? Even the saints didn't become that way overnight. They went through the same process that you and I, every step of the way. The Bible says we should forgive 7 times 70. Yep. Which roughly translates into, which, 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 which actually means <laughs> forever, <laughs> perfection, eternity, forever. You can't go, yep, bing, <laughs> I don't have to forgive you anymore. I mean. So thank you. Uh, we, that Bill shared that the, the, the calculation of that. It was like I was like, whoa. No, no. We have to rely upon His grace, but we also have to do our part through Kashem. It is a matter of what do you desire? What do you desire for yourself, and what do you desire for your loved ones? Then you and I have to make choices and different choices sometimes. Change doesn't take place automatically. Luke chapter 12 and verse 1. Luke 12 and verse 1. Uh, just one a few chapter over, just a few page, I mean, probably one page. It says, In the meantime, when an innumerable multitude of people had gathered together so that they trampled over one another, he began to say to his disciples, first of all, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is what? Hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. There is nothing covered that will not be revealed, nor hidden that will not be known. Therefore, whatever you have spoken in the dark will be heard in the light, and whatever you have spoken in the ear in the inner rooms will be proclaimed on the housetops. Okay, who is he talking to right here? He is. He's talking to the people that had gathered there. Okay, the multitudes of people, and there were so many people that they were they were, they were stumbling over each other. Okay, they were they wanted to hear what he had to say. But he tells them to beware 
the hypocrisy, which, which is the leaven. Okay, what does leaven do, if, if you were to put it into bread? Okay. Um, yep, so, yeah, you, you have to, you know, work, work the leaven in it. What's that? Knead it. Okay, knead it. Puffs up. Puffs up. Um, okay, so um, in bread, it's a good thing. In human souls, it's a bad thing. Okay, Puff, puffing up is also a, another word for pride. And pride kills people. He says, avoid the leaven of the Pharisees. Okay, why would he say that? What does he mean? Did, were they bread makers? I mean, what, what did they do? Because they tell you to do things that don't do it themselves. Okay. Um, he says elsewhere uh, to his, to his um, he says, you hypocrites, you bind up heavy burdens and place them on people's back, and it says that you don't lift a finger to relieve those burdens. And he was saying is that Many of the times, not always, there were some righteous Pharisees who sought to follow God, but he says, you tell them to do these things, but you don't do them yourself. And here is where he's, he's saying about the hypocrisy. In the ancient world, the Greek word for actor was a metaphor for a hypocrite because actors are people that play part, a part on a stage but is not genuinely who they are, but an illusion. Okay, so an actor is metaphorically a hypocrite. They, they portray something they're not. Okay, he says, don't be like that. But the reality is, are we like that? Yes. We say we're, we're followers, messianics, Christians, followers of the king, and do we do it perfectly? God have mercy on me, a sinner. The sooner that we realize that we are hypocrites, because we all say one thing and do another, the more grounded we will become because we will speak truly that we are in the process of this journey. To acknowledge oneself as a hypocrite is a gesture of humility and a humbling of oneself. It is really hard to judge others when you know your own true state. God have mercy on me, a sinner. Uh, is it easy to, to look in the mirror and say that to yourself? No, because we want to think the best of ourselves, don't we? We want to believe, oh no, not me. God have mercy on us. He says that there will be nothing hidden that is truly hidden, which will not be revealed. What, what, what does he mean by these words? Okay, God sees all, yes. What else? Eventually, other people catch on. Okay, eventually, other people catch on, yes. Well, in the antiquity, uh, Jewish homes were built with, with kind of like a, like a porch on top. Okay, you've probably seen it in, in, in different movies or different drawings. Uh, and in the evening, uh, people would, would hang out on, on the porch uh, uh, on top of the roof. Why do you think they would do that? Because it was hot, man. <laughs> And when you're up a little bit higher, then you get the little bit of the, the breeze that comes through. Um, I mean, I, I'm told that we, we just did that here in Georgia before we had air conditioning, right? You sit on the porch and let the breeze blow. Well, what do you think happens when people gather together? Um, if you can imagine a home here and a home here and a home there, and there wasn't a whole lot of space between it. What do you, what do you, think, what do you think happened on those porches? Pineapples? No. What's that? They saw everything and they also... Shared. They shared stories. They shared, they shared, hey, did you hear about uh, that, that guy out in the wilderness you know, saying repent? Um, hey, did you, did you hear about uh, you know, Yaakov? Um, you know, I think he's a little mashugana. <laughs> uh, did, did, I mean, you shared the stories. You shared, shared gossip. You shared, you shared information. There was no internet. Uh, there, 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 was no, no, there were no telephones. Information was shared from house to house to house. And like a ripple, it went out. We have a prayer that says, Behold, the judge shall come, and the actions of everyone will be revealed. The scripture says that we will, are held accountable for every word that comes out of our mouths. We're responsible not for every thought in our minds, but what we do with it. If you have an, a, a horrible thought, Cast it aside. 
It's not, it's not becoming of you. It's not, it's not your thought. Cast it aside. And replace it with God, Yeshua. Yeshua, Son of God, have mercy on me. We, we cast off that which is not good and we replace it with the good things. Um, if you have a jar, and, and this jar here is full of cookies, and this jar here is, is full of... Um, Kale? No? <laughs> Kale. Kale that's, that, that's decomposed. <laughs> what do you do with it? Do you eat it? Okay. But, but you want the jar. You want to save the jar. So you clean it. That jar is valuable to you, so you clean it out. You don't just accept it. It's filled with muck. You clean it out, and you put it to the use that, that it was designed for, which could be jelly beans, I don't know. <laughs> so Baruch Hashem, he says that there will be a revelation. Um, only what we do not repent of in this life will be held to our account. Whatever you have done, whatever you have thought, whatever you have desired that is not godly, if we repent of it in this life, it is not held to our account in the world to come. Messiah says in uh, verse 4, And I say to you, my friends, but do not be afraid of those who kill the body, but after that they have no more they can do. Okay? Now he's shifted. He, he, was, he was speaking to the multitudes. Okay? And now he's talking to who? To his disciples. Um, he's talking to you and to me. He's like, okay, you know, I've said what I need to say to the multitudes, but now, my friends, come aside with me for a minute and let's talk. He says, do not be afraid of those who can kill the body and after that have no more they can do, but I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he is killed, has the power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Who is he referring to? Himself. Okay. He, yes, yes, himself. He's referring to God. Okay, We, I, tremble at what I think other people think. I, I tremble at what I see other people. Okay? I tremble because I do not trust in God. God have mercy on me, a sinner. He says that we must be seeking to understand who is we serve. He's not a myth. He's not a story. He is the eternal living one. And he is the God of the universe. Amen. He says, and of this, he says, do, do not be afraid. Because he knew that many of the people that he spoke to right there, which were some of his, his apostles, who would later become his apostles, he knew how they would pass from this life. Um, did, was their life wine and roses no. after he ascended? Did they go, yeah, we got this Jesus thing now, and uh, I'm going to live good. How did they live? They, they, they lived selflessly. They, they, they went accomplishing their mission. Uh, sometimes they were hungry. Sometimes they, they, they didn't have any place, so they, they slept on the side of the road, wherever it was. Sometimes people showed them hospitality. And, and, and they lived and they accomplished their mission, not so they could acquire stuff. He says, what is it that you desire? He's also talking to them of the bravery, because many of them would stand before Political people who would stand before the emperor and they would have to give an account. Okay, when you got called before the magistrate or the emperor and you said, I am a Christian, I am a believer, um, you had two choices. It seems to be a recurring theme, doesn't it? Sacrifice to the idols and live, or two, hold fast to this Yeshua and die. In, in fact, they made it even, made it even better than that. They, they sweetened the pot, so it were. Um, after they beat you, or did other types of, of terrible things, they would say, hey, listen, um, it's okay, we understand, you're, you're probably not thinking clearly here. We want to give you all of this money and these honors if you'll simply just say you don't believe in the Yeshua. We will give you position, and we will give you honor and wealth, and you will live well. And you know, many people chose 
that. But the, those who would not compromise their faith, and the apostles numbered among them, among the thousands of men and women martyrs, they would not bow to false gods. And they would deride them saying, your, your statue of whatever is a demon. I'm not going to bow to that. Why would you, a human being, bow to? And they would deride them. The one, and they would be the, 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 the people who had authority to kill them said, What? You're going to talk to us like that? They say, I will not bow my knee except for the one true God. And they suffered. So Messiah was saying to them, He said, Don't fear these people. All they have is, is, is the ability to take your life, your stuff. Who cares? But fear God and God alone. And they went bravely into the arena wherever it was that they were called to give an account. And, and they went through whatever it is that they were called to. They boldly confessed, and they suffered. Many of them, if you read the stories, they received a grace from God in those times that they no longer felt the suffering of the body. And it didn't matter what the person did to beat them or hurt them. And they praised God in the middle of it. Did you ever wonder how Stephen was able to praise God in the middle of being stoned? Did you ever wonder how many of, of if you've heard any of the stories, even of the apostles who were crucified, how they endured that? Because God gave them the grace, the ability to bear witness. Martyrios means witness. It's lost its, its, its it's meaning. It wasn't just someone who died. It was somebody who gave a witness to the truth. In a court, that's what a witness gives, theoretically. Bearing witness to the truth. And these are what the martyrs bore witness to, the truth of Yeshua. So how do we avoid the judgment of God? I mean, are, are we going to be judged? Yes. Yep. How do we avoid his judgment? Keep hmm? Okay. Clean the slate with repentance. How else? That's right. Yep. He says every man will be rewarded. Rewarded. Reward is 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 is, is given for whatever it is we've done. Unrighteous, even the unbelievers, will be rewarded. But you don't want it. It isn't what you want. So, Messiah says, repent. And be baptized, and then spend the rest of our lives living in repentance, doing teshuva, and showing mercy to others. Those are the words of, of Yeshua. Whatever we do in this life echoes into eternity. You want forgiveness from God? Then forgive the others their debts to you. Do you want mercy from God? Then be merciful to others like you desire from your Father in heaven. We look for ways to bless others, to, to take care, to feed those who are hungry, to give others the benefit of the doubt. Would you like the benefit of the doubt given to you? Absolutely. Yes. Then we must be willing to share this with others. We invest the gold of our time in the souls of others. This is the way that we are to follow him. Whatever it is that we desire, God, you know, Yeshua says, do that. He says, if we do, we do things to others, should we do unto others as they do, do unto us? Um, no, not unless you, you got a rewritten one. Rewritten. He said, we do unto others as we would desire. Is it easy? Nope. It takes the grace of God, a supernatural reality of which we struggle with and to do his works. Did the apostles go, yeah, well, we've been baptized, uh, we've received the Spirit of God on Pentecost, and now it's smooth sailing. Nope. They had their contest, their journey to complete, just the same as you and I. In verse 8, he says, Also I say to you that whoever confesses me before men, him the Son of Man will also confess before the, the angels of God. 
But he who denies me before men will be denied before the angels of God. And anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. But to him who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven. Now, when you, they bring you into the synagogues and the magistrates and the authorities, do not worry about how or what you ought to answer for, or what you should say, for his Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. Amen. Okay, the holy martyrs and unbelievers who have gone into situations, they didn't have a script written out. Um, they didn't have a speech. Um, but they, they went there, and the Spirit of God spoke through them in those days. They didn't deny him or make excuses, and they were offered these riches, what, what's the problem with, with riches and wealth? Okay, they go away. Well, they tie you down. They tie they us down. Responsibility to take care of them. Yep. They can be taken. They can be taken, yes. What's that? You always want more. Okay, we always want more. If you have too much stuff. Okay. If we have too much stuff, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to deteriorate. Uh, whatever it is, unless it's a, um, a chunk of gold uh, or a diamond, it, it's going to weather probably even those, but those are going to last out a little bit longer. Um, so you got a chunk of gold, clutching this chunk of gold. Um, no, if we seek the things which will, that we are honored in this world, okay, um, popularity and fame, uh, is that a real thing? Uh, what do you see in the trends of this, of this world? When they raise up somebody and say, oh, they're amazing. We love you. Okay, what happens like five minutes later? Uh, that person says something stupid like, I don't know, like I would say probably, and everybody hates them all of a sudden. Huh. Minute you were standing on top of the earth, and now you're the schmutz of the earth. I had to work that in. No. Um, they love you for a second, and they hate you the next. Uh, you have this, and then you die. Uh, and when you die, uh, no matter how much you want to, you can't take whatever it is that you have worked to acquire. But what can you take with you that you also lay effort into? The witness that we've given, yes. What else? Faith, Faith yes. Love that you show others. Say again. The love that you show yes, the love that we've shown others. Uh, you take with you that which you have done. Our deeds, what we have done. And it says that he will give an, a reward to each. So when we continue... In verse 13, we're not going to take time to, to read it necessarily, uh, but we know this, this, this parable where, um, well, we'll, actually, we'll read 13, uh, verse 13 through 15. It says, uh, from one of the crowd said to him, teacher, my brother, uh, tell my brother to d divide the inheritance with me. And he said to them, man, who made me a judge or an arbitrator over you? What, what do you think he's saying there? Okay. So it was traditional for rabbis to um, render perhaps judgments in legal, legal matters. Um, what did he say to this person who said, hey, um, tell my brother to divide my inheritance? I take it to mean this is unimportant. This is unimportant. Um, what? Uh, I didn't... It, yeah. He says, ah, you know, I'm not here for that. Uh, they wanted him to free Israel by the sword from Rome. And he was like, that's not why I came. If you read into the scriptures, that's what the Messiah was supposed to do, you read it wrong. Here is why I have come. He says, continuing, that take heed and beware of covetousness, for one does not, one's life does not consist in abundance of the things that he possesses. Okay? Covet, covetedness. What is that? Perhaps it's wanting what someone else has. It's um, 
Did you ever um, see something or somebody, maybe it's somebody watched on whatever device we watch these days, and you say, why can't that be me? Why don't I have that or this? Okay, certain things are not wrong to want. It's when we take that and we place it where? Yep, in our hearts and in front of our eyes, that we, all we can see is this thing now. And if you can't, if you that, then it is called a, an idol. Mm -hmm. An idol that, that blocks us from seeing. So in reality, and I think Cynthia said a second ago, when people strive, we strive to acquire so many things. What, what are those things called? Mm -hmm. um, possessions. That we no longer possess these things. But they possess us. They become that which we desire. Why do you think, that, you know the old phrase, um, keeping up with the Joneses? Okay. What, what is that phrase? If, for, for, for those who don't know, what, what does it mean? Having what your neighbor has. Okay. Uh, you know, the person who lives next door and you go, oh gosh, they've got, oh, no, I've got to have it. Uh, do you think that the media plays on, on our desire for stuff? No? Oh, I mean, you know, this thing, um, this, this thing is obsolete. It, it was obsolete when it came out, but I've had it for several years now. It's obsolete, and, and, and they want me to buy the current one, and which, again, it's not wrong to have a current phone, but they say you can't be happy unless you have the latest technology. Well, I could rarely ever afford the latest technology to begin with, so I had to settle for whatever I could afford. Um, is having a new phone going to make me a better person? No. Uh, what could it actually make me? <laughs> There's that, especially me. So, uh, I, I could. I'm now. I'm not happy because this new phone that I just bought, and they just released a new, a new version of it. And I'm always seeking, never satisfied, always thinking if I can just be, if I can just have this or that, I'm going to be happy and fulfilled. Okay, whatever the toy is that, that you like, it's not wrong necessarily. Whatever you get it, it's going to be nice for a minute, a day, a week, or whatever. But that's not who you are. That's not, it's not who you are. It's not what you are. They're simply tools or possessions that we have a choice in how we acquire them. Yeah. He had a bunch of stuff, by the way. Yeah. Uh, I but I buy a brand new car and driving it off the lot and it yep. $3,000. Yep. <laughs> and our father, David, uh, whom we hold in highest veneration here, uh, who is our patron, he had everything mm -hmm. in the way that he could have desired and even, even in the midst of his, of, his fall, of his failings, he always did something. What was that? He did teshuva. He did repentance. He always kept his sin. Okay, why do you think he says, I keep my sin always before me? Why would he say that? Uh, we're, we're among the only people that have a book filled with our failings as a people. Uh, your family history, uh, a little good and a whole lot of bad. Why do you think that our failings are written here? So we don't, so we don't repeat them. Um, we follow, unfortunately, in the footsteps of those who came before us, and we, we do many of the same mistakes, but we have a choice. Um, the carrot and the donkey. What's the purpose of the carrot? What's that? It's a treat. I mean, you can put whatever you want in front of it, chocolate croissant. Uh, Whatever you want. Uh, so, um, but what, what, what happens to that donkey? It never actually gets the treat. Right. It just keeps following. Yes. Okay. If I just get a little closer, to the, a little closer. to the carrot, uh -huh. I'll get it. the carrot moves a little bit further. This is the ways of the world. Or licorice. See, you see, the, the carrot is the proverbial 
whatever it is that keeps the beast moving forward, um, it, it, it appeals to whatever is the lowest in us. But we cannot be allowed, allowing ourselves to be swayed by the world. Because the world wants us to become like it. Um, what, what is the world? Vile, schmutz, um, sad, dark, despondent, hopeless. And they say, we want you to be just like us. Hmm, let me see. Sad, dark, hopeless, schmutz. <laughs> or beautiful, light, whole, peaceful. Joy-filled. Which should we choose? Hmm. No, we must be those that seek the face of God. Here is where truth lies. And we must cleanse our hearts and make our souls beautiful and ready for eternity. Um, when the bridegroom uh, comes, what well, does it say that the, that the virgins says that, that, that they did something? The five wise and the five foolish. What did the five foolish do? They ran out of oil. Okay. And what did the wise ones do? Okay. They prepared themselves. They, they filled the vessel of the heart with oil, the Rukach Hadisha, through the presence, through seeking of God. And it says that all of them fell asleep but they had prepared the ones that were wise. So may we also be those that are wise and prepare now while we have awareness. Will you do this? Will you journey with the King of Kings in this life? We do not act on our own, but we must act on our own behalf. We are partners, co-heirs, and participants in this journey with God. Aren't you glad you're not alone? May your and my life be dedicated to this divine reality so that we can enjoy fellowship with him in the radiant wedding feast forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Oh Lord our God, help us to take this garden that we've been given, the heart, and master that we may begin to cultivate it today, starting today. No matter what, there is always more that can be done. Oh Lord, give us your grace, your power to accomplish. This is your will for us to become like you. Master of all, may you be glorified. And may we learn to praise you even in the spite of the challenges so that we can echo the words of those that came before us to say glory to God for all things so that you may be glorified today and into eternity. We love you and we bless this in the name of the Holy King of Kings, your only begotten Son, Yeshua Hamalek. Unto him be glory and honor in both worlds. Amen. Amen.